In this video, we're going to continue considering the question, why does your kettle boil? This lecture is going to cover specific and latent heat and why water is such a special material. In the last video, we were considering how you could add heat to a substance. What we're going to look at in this video is how that added heat changes the temperature of a substance. So different substances require different amounts of heat to be added in order to change their temperature. When we add heat to a substance, it's adding energy. So it makes the little particles which make up the substance vibrate more. And temperature is actually defined as the internal kinetic energy of the substance. So as we add that energy, it does actually cause the temperature to increase. Now imagine that we had a wooden object and a metal object in the sun on a hot day. If you left them for the same amount of time and then went to touch them, the metal object would be a lot hotter than the wooden object, and not just because it's better at conducting heat. It also increases its temperature a lot more with the same amount of energy added to it. So the amount of energy you need to add to raise one kilogram of a substance one degrees Celsius or one degrees Kelvin, that's equivalent, is called the specific heat of that material. So wood has a much higher specific heat than metal. You need to add a lot more energy to wood to increase its temperature than you do to metal. So aluminium, for example, has a specific heat of around about 900 joules per kelvin per kilogram. Wood is around about 1,700 joules per kelvins per kilograms. Now we're very lucky. Water actually has a very, very large specific heat compared to most substances. The specific heat of water is 4,186 joules per kelvins per kilograms. And why this is lucky is because a lot of the Earth's surface is covered by water. This means, because of the large specific heat, we need to put in a lot of energy into the water to change its temperature. So this large specific heat actually helps to mitigate global warming. When we add heat to the ocean, we have to add a lot of heat to change its temperature. Now we're very lucky to live in coastal regions like Sydney because we have the ocean right next to us. Now the ocean can absorb a lot of heat with a very small change in temperature. And this helps to minimize temperature changes. When it's a hot day, the ocean absorbs a lot of heat and doesn't change its temperature very much. When it's a cool evening, the ocean releases a lot of heat without changing its temperature very much. In desert regions like Alice Springs on the other hand, when it's a hot day, you're surrounded by sand, which is basically silicon dioxide instead of by water. The specific heat of silicon dioxide is more like 1000 joules per kilogram per Kelvin as opposed to 4186 for water. So in the desert, the temperature of the sand changes a lot more in the day, the temperature will increase a lot more, and overnight when it's cold, the temperature of the sand also changes a lot more rapidly, so it cools down a lot more quickly. And this is why you get such extreme temperature swings in the desert. The land to water ratio in the Northern Hemisphere is much higher than in the Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, we've got a lot more water than they do in the Northern Hemisphere. So this is why global warming at the moment is more extreme in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere. We're putting the water in the Southern Hemisphere is managing to absorb a lot more of the heat with a very small change in temperature compared to the land in the Northern Hemisphere, which changes its temperature much more readily as you put heat into it. Okay, so let's consider the equation relating specific heat to change in temperature. The heat, which is the energy added to the object, is equal to the mass of the object times the specific heat of the object times the change in temperature of the object. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of how we could use this equation. A wooden spoon has a mass of 100 grams. 
A stainless steel spoon has an equivalent mass. If 780 joules of heat energy is added to the spoons, what is the change in temperature of the spoons? We're told that the specific heat of wood is 1,700 joules per kilogram per kelvin and the specific heat of steel is 502 joules per kilogram per kelvin. So the equation that we're going to have to use in this case is Q is equal to mc delta T and what we're trying to find is this change in temperature. So let's rearrange it. The change in temperature is equal to Q over mc. Now in this question we're told that the heat added Q is equal to 780 joules and the mass of the spoons is 100 grams which is 0 0.100 kilograms. To get the mass into kilograms we just divide by a thousand. And so the change in temperature is 780 over 0 0.100 times for the wooden spoon 1700. And solving this on the calculator we get 4.6 degrees C. So that's the change in temperature of the wooden spoon. The change in temperature of the steel spoon is equal to Q, which is 780 over MC, which is 0 0.100 times 502. And solving this one on the calculator, we get 15.6 degrees C. So you can see that the steel spoon has a much larger change in temperature than the wooden spoon, which is why it's a good idea to use wooden spoons to serve hot saucepans rather than steel spoons. Another question to try. How much energy do you need to add to raise 1.5 litres of water up from 25 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius? If a kettle uses 1,500 watts of power, how long will this take? So that's a relatively low wattage for a kettle. So first of all, we need to work out how much energy is added. So to do that, we're going to have to use our formula Q is equal to mc delta t, where m is the mass, c is the specific heat, and delta t is the change in temperature. So the mass, we've got 1.5 litres of water. Now one litre of water weighs 1,000 grams. So this is 1.5 kilograms of water. The specific heat for water is 4,186 joules per kilogram per kelvin and the change in temperature is equal to the final temperature minus the initial temperature which is equal to 100 degrees C minus 25 degrees C so this is around about room temperature so this gives us 75 degrees C is the change in temperature and so the amount of heat we need to add is given by 1.5 times 4186 times this change in temperature, the 75. And solving that on the calculator, we get 470,925 joules, which we can write as 471 kilojoules. We convert it to kilojoules by dividing by 1,000. Now what we need to do is work out how long it's going to take. So we know that power is equal to energy over time, and in this case we've got huge heat energy. So that's Q over time. So the time, just rearranging this equation, we can see that time will be Q over the power. So the amount of energy added is 470,925 and the power used is 1,500 watts. So solving this we get 313.95 and that's in seconds. Now if we want to get the time in minutes, we have to do 313.95 divided by 60 and this gives us 5.23 minutes. So that's a relatively long time but this is a relatively low wattage kettle and 1.5 litres is quite a lot of water to put in the kettle. So that is a completely reasonable answer. Now when we add heat to a substance, it can cause its temperature to change, but the other thing it can do is cause it to change state. So for example, we could cause ice to melt. We have to add heat to cause the ice to become liquid water. 
We also need to add heat to cause the water to boil, so to cause the water to turn from a liquid to a gas, which is what happens when our kettle starts to boil. So the amount of heat we have to add to cause a substance to change state is called the latent heat. We can have the latent heat of vaporization, which is the amount of heat we need to put in to cause it to change from a liquid to a gas, or we can have the latent heat of fusion, which is the amount of water we uh, which is the amount of heat we need to put in to cause it to change from a solid to a liquid. The equation relating the amount of heat we need to put in to the mass of the substance is given by heat is equal to the mass of the substance times L, which is the latent heat, either of vaporization or fusion, depending on what process we're doing. Now there's no change in temperature term there because as this heat is being transferred, the substance stays at a constant temperature. We will look at this in a bit more detail very shortly, but for now let's just have a look at an example of how we can make use of that latent heat equation. Okay, so we're asked, calculate the amount of heat that needs to be added to convert a 20 gram ice block from ice to water. How much heat needs to be added to convert 20 grams of liquid water to a gas? And we're told the latent heat of fusion for water is 3.33 times 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram, and the latent heat of vaporization for water is 2.26 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. So to work out the amount of heat that we need to add, we can just use the formula Q is equal to ML. Now as this is in joules per kilogram, we're going to need our mass in kilograms rather than in grams. So the mass in kilograms is 20 times 10 to the minus 3, which is the same as 20 divided by 1000. And then we multiply it by the latent heat of fusion, so that's 3.33 times 10 to the 5. So solving this on the calculator, we get 6,660 joules. So we need to add 6,660 joules of energy to melt the ice. Now this is why you add ice cubes to your drink on a hot day. If you add an ice cube, which would be about 20 grams of ice, then it needs to absorb this much energy from the surrounding drink to melt. And so as it melts, it absorbs that energy from the drink, which lowers the temperature of the drink because the energy is given by Q equals MC delta T, so the temperature of the drink decreases and that is how you'll, you cool your drink. Now to calculate how much heat we need to add to cause the water to turn into gas, we use Q is equal to ML, but we're now using the latent heat of vaporization. So once again the mass is 20 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms and then we use the 2.26 times 10 to the 6 and solving this we get 45,200 joules. So that is actually why you have evolved to sweat on a hot day. So on a hot day you produce this liquid on your skin, the liquid then evaporates and as it turns into a gas it absorbs this energy. So if you were to evaporate one tablespoon of sweat it would require approximately this much energy and so that energy would be lost from you and you would be cooled down. What we're going to consider now is what happens to a kettle filled with ice as we add energy at a constant rate, i.e. a constant power. What you can see here is when the power goes on and the kettle's heated, first of all the added energy from the power goes into melting the ice. While this happens, the temperature remains at a constant 0 degrees C. When the ice is finished melting, the power added through the electrical power then goes into heating the water and increasing the water's temperature 
from 0 degrees C to 100 degrees C. When it gets to 100 degrees C, the extra heat energy which is added goes into boiling the water and converting the water into gas. So we saw that water was special because it had such a high specific heat, which was very lucky for us on Earth. Water is also special for another reason. We said that liquids expand as they are heated. Water does this as well, but only above 4 degrees C. Below 4 degrees C, water actually contracts as it's heated, which is actually, as we'll see, very lucky for fish. So imagine that we had a pond on a warm day. The temperature is well above 4 degrees C, maybe 24 degrees C, say. So the pond is at thermal equilibrium at 24 degrees C. The sun comes up. It starts heating the pond up. As the pond heats, the water expands a little bit and that expanded water is less dense and so it floats on top. In the next topic we'll be looking at the formulas for calculating density etc. So on a warm day you end up with a warm layer of water on top of the pond. This is why you're, if you're the first person to go swimming in a swimming pool on a warm summer's day, you'll notice that the top of the water is much warmer than down below because the warm water is floating on top of the cooler water. Now let's say it's the middle of water. The ponds, now let's say it's the middle of winter. The ponds cooled down to four degrees C and the atmosphere is a bit cooler than that. Say the atmosphere is at two degrees C. So the top of the pond now gets cooled by the atmosphere. The top layer goes down to 2 degrees C. Now, if water behaved like a normal liquid, that 2 degrees C layer would be heavier than the layers below and so would sink to the bottom. But water's special. Because it's below 4 degrees C, that 2 degrees Celsius layer is actually less dense than the four degrees water below. So you actually end up with a cooler layer floating on top. Now this is why ice always forms on the top of the pond, not down the bottom. When the ice is formed, water expands when it freezes, which is why the ice always ends up floating on top. But in most liquids, the ice would actually form at the bottom because you would have the cooler liquid down the bottom and in most liquids as well, when the solid is formed, it is more dense than the liquid. And so you get the solid formed down the bottom and staying there. However, with water, you get the ice formed on top and it stays on top of the pond. And the ice then forms an insulating layer between the cooler atmosphere and the rest of the pond. So the bottom of the pond stays at approximately four degrees C through the winter, unless it gets too cold so that the entire a very pond very freezes. cold winter or a very small pond for that to happen it would never happen for example in the locks in Scotland because the quantity of water in those locks is just so great so in this video we've seen how to calculate specific and latent heat in the next video we're going to look at some experimental techniques because you're now going to perform an experiment where you measure the specific heat of water using a kettle Special thanks to John T. Horner for help with filming this. Also thanks to all these people who provided images with the Creative Commons license which we made use of.